Hello and welcome to another episode of Tactical Startup. Uh, today we are going to have Anna Maria Serrano. She is, she served in the Army Reserves for 20 plus years and is now retired. She earned her PhD in psychology in 2021 and is working on getting her dissertation published. I founded God's Heart Ministry slash Las Valientes 20 year, 21 years ago. She will be celebrating 20 years of service to the community on May 21st, 2022, with a murder mystery dinner. Sounds like she's, she runs a, a nonprofit. So there's all types of different businesses that I want to expose my listeners to because there isn't just one way to solve a problem. And while entrepreneurship, typically most people are in it for a portion of it for the money, having a nonprofit is a great way to accomplish some great goals while uh, building a community. So let's get started, shall we? You're listening to Tactical Startup, a podcast dedicated to building amazing businesses. I'm your host, Taylor Darcy. In this podcast, we explore ways to innovate, improve, and level up your business through sales, marketing, automation, and business planning. Successful businesses pivot when times are bad and stay the course when times are good. We will have guests from different walks of life to help you see that success is not only possible, but even probable, no matter when or where you start. Through hard work and strategic planning, you can have the entrepreneurial life you've always dreamed. Tune in weekly to level up your business. Anna Maria, it's great to have you. How are you today? I'm well, thank you. Good. So glad to have you. So tell us, tell me a little bit about Las Valientes. What exactly do they do? So Las Valientes is a nonprofit that I founded uh, 21 years ago. Our corporate name is God's Heart Ministry. Uh, and the program that we run that or that we started uh, is Las Valientes, which in English means the brave ones, because we help women come out of domestic violence through the legal system. We help um, we help women get restraining orders, divorces, custody, child support. Yeah, we help them with a lot of family law issues. Uh, over the years, we have uh, added programs to help the community in general who don't have domestic violence issues and they just need a divorce or they need custody taken care of or maybe a child support issue that needs to be dealt with. Uh, we've also begun to help with guardianships, uh, supervised visits, uh, just a variety of services uh, that the community may need. So. We, we've grown a lot over the last 20 years. Very nice. I th and I think that's a, such a, an area that needs help. Uh, there's unfortunately not enough resources devoted to people that are in those types of situations. Um, okay. So I think that's a, a solid uh, place to start. And more importantly, I think that, you know, solving a problem, which, you know, by, by and large, that's a big one, right? Like, it's unfortunate that it is a big one, right? In a perfect society, in a perfect world, those wouldn't be problems. Um, but we don't live in that, unfortunately. Um, so how did you, how did you start? What, what, does, what made you decide to start that? Because that's not exactly a lighthearted, <laughs> fun, entertaining idea that you're thinking, oh, this is a good, this is something that I'll enjoy doing in, in that respect, right? right? Most people that start businesses are like, ooh, I'm good at this. I want to do that. So tell me about <laughs> why you decided to get into something so challenging. So it all started um, after I divorced my ex-husband uh, because I wasn't an, uh, an abused woman for 13 years. And uh, when I finally decided to leave, uh, I had God and I had my attorney and that was all I had. <laughs> so I had a really good attorney who uh, helped me out, got my divorce. I started working at a nonprofit in Escondido um, since uh, I worked there for just a couple years, I remember, and I was under a grant. And so my job was to help women go get restraining orders. That was my whole job. And then go do um, uh, visits with them. I had to do six visits with them. And then within those six visits, convince the woman to leave the abusive person. Uh, of course, we knew that was never going to happen, but that was right. the job that I had. <laughs> so 
uh, once the money for that grant ran out, uh, I had no job. There was just nowhere else to put me. So uh, one day I was just like, okay, well, now what do I do? You know, and, uh, you know, because I'm a, a woman of prayer, I was like, okay, Lord, well, now what? And he goes, well, start your own nonprofit. And I was like, right. Well, okay, well, how do I do that? Like, I have no idea. <laughs> He's never done that before. Wow. So he brought people around me who knew what they were doing. Uh, I had to get incorporated first through the state, so I got my incorporation. I had no idea that then I had to do actual paperwork for a 501c3 uh, until I went to my accountant. And she said, oh, yeah, you need to do your 501c3 because I had applied for a, uh, a foundation grant, and they said, you don't have a 501c3. And I was like, what? I was like, how can that be? Oh so, my, okay. Well, that's how I learned that I had to do paperwork for the IRS. My accountant helped me do that. And uh, then we got the 501c3 and I started out the same, just helping women get restraining orders. And as people got those restraining orders, they started asking me about, well, what about a divorce? Can you help me with my divorce? And I was like, uh, no. But at that time, I was working with an attorney, uh, with Roger Thompson, may he rest in peace. But he taught me everything I know about family law. Um, nice. So that's kind of how I, I started, uh, was I had the, those mentors who just taught me. And because I had been uh, an abused woman and I came out of that situation, that was simply the call that God placed on my life and and i enjoyed it I, I i enjoyed working with the women there were some hard moments because you know she didn't want to leave but there was nothing i could do except tell her well when you're ready you know just call me back which they usually did yeah. and when they were ready then we just walked them through the process so i learned a lot and over the years we've just added different services <laughs> sounds like it so you know, unlike a regular business where, you know, most businesses, uh, and I'm not saying regular because nonprofit is absolutely a regular business. It's just a different tax structure. Let's, let's call it what it is. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, to be fair, it's, it's not fair to say you're not a regular business. I apologize. Did not mean that. Um, a, a for-profit business focuses on the money, right? Like that's how they exist. And there, and, and while, you know, there's nothing wrong with that in theory, you know, there's, it can't be all things to all people, right? Like it's just, it's not meant to, there's, there are people such as your clients that need your help that yes. can't legitimately afford the for-profit services, Correct. especially when you're talking about a, an abused woman who typically one doesn't have the resources from a physical standpoint. Mm -hmm. We're not talking like, and then from a mental standpoint, uh, right. imagine that they've been abused to the point where they don't know how to function without yes. the, it, there's there's a lot of issue with that and so right. um what how how do you because you know with no money i mean or i should say not the like not the typical for-profit where money comes in via who you serve uh how do you raise money how do you stay in business essentially so when so so this is something my accountant had to teach me and also um, Roger, uh, because I used to do when I first started this, I used to do everything for free. And I used to take the clients to Roger, I would interpret for them. And Roger would ask me because I had to work a second job and he would ask me, so how do you make money? And I said, well, I work a second job. And he said, you know, Anna, well, he used to call me Annie. He would say, you know, Annie, I want you to charge me for interpreting for the client you just brought me. And I said, charge you? He said, yes, charge me. And I said, well, I don't know, how much should I charge you? He said, I don't care, just charge me something. And right. I remember I looked at him and I said, uh, $40. And he said, okay, send me an invoice and I'll pay you $40. And I was like, okay, because he he saw the value of what I was doing, but he, he clearly told me you need to be paid. Right. And so he taught me that it's okay to charge. Yes, I'm a nonprofit, but I still need to charge money. And it's okay because the clients would come up with the money. Right. If they were able to come up with the money to pay an attorney, then they would be able to come up with money to pay me to go to court with them, to sit with them, to hold their hand and whatever needed to be done. And so he taught me a great lesson. Right. Um, the other lesson that I learned was actually from my accountant, because I'll never forget one time 
uh, I had I had some lady, I, I, she referred a client to me. And uh, I mean, we charge nominal fees. I mean, we don't charge right. very much. But she got mad at me because I charged her client. And I went to my accountant and I said, why is she getting mad at me for charging the client a small fee? Right. She said, because people don't understand that just because you're nonprofit doesn't mean that you have to give everything free. Right. The difference between a for-profit and a nonprofit is that when you're for-profit, all the profits go to the boss or the founder, right? And they can do whatever sure, they want with right. that money. Right. right. They can pay for employees, their bills, whatever. The difference is that for a nonprofit, you can charge, but the money that comes in has to be used for the community. Right. Ever since she told me that, I was like, oh, okay. I don't feel bad about charging it because I am. We used a fund for the community. Well, and I think that you, you struck on something, and this is what a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with, is number one, you know, you can have good intentions and good will, but if you yeah. don't charge, how do you continue to deliver those services to yeah. other people, right? Like, because you have costs, you have overhead. It's not as though just because people don't give you for free, right? Like you still have rent. You, I, I'm actually a, on a, I'm a, on the board of directors of a nonprofit myself. So I'm, I'm at the, the, uh, at a different point, right? And we discussed these things where it's like, okay, where does this money go that we get grants for that the company right. gets or that the 501c3 gets uh, grants for? But they still have to charge, right? Because at the end of the day, and here's the other principle that needs to be taught, people don't value what they get for free. Exactly. Imagine a kid that gets something for free. And, and we're all kids. This is not a, this is, this is acknowledgement of us as a human person, not as a, a condescending way. We're all kids. When we get something for free, what do we do with it? We throw it on the ground. We don't care what happens to it. And you can't charge a kid, right? But at the same time, when we're dealing with, even in a situation with, um, as where you're with, charging them helps them commit to it right? Exactly. It, it shows them, it makes it to the point you commit to things either via time or money. Right. Those are your commitments. If you yeah. don't have the money, then you've got to figure it out on your own. Well, in exactly. these instances, I'm, if I had to venture a guess, these women, time is not their friend, right? Because the longer things go on, the longer things go on, exactly. right? And, and so time is not their friend. They don't have the time. And they're more likely to get caught. They're more likely to be abused in that situation. So time's not their friend. So the few dollars, whatever you're charging, uh, I, and I don't know, I don't know what you're charging, but uh, it certainly goes a long way towards getting a resolution a lot faster, a lot quicker, and getting out of that bad situation uh, in, a, in a way that says, okay, I'm going to, my health, my humanity is, has more value than the $20, $40. I don't know what you charge, but you know, whatever amount you charge uh, has. And, and that's so true because I have a lot of clients, especially because I know so many attorneys. Right. One of the first things they'll ask me is, do you know a pro bono attorney? And I say, nope, don't yep. know a one. And they're like, no, but why? Like, I don't have no money. And I'm like, well, okay. I'm going to tell you why you don't want a pro bono attorney because you're going to go to that attorney. You're going to ask him to please or her to do your, your service for free. And if they agree, if by chance they agree, they're going to go, okay. And they're going to take all your paperwork. They're going to set it aside. They're going to help their clients that are paying them first. And then if they remember and they decide, then they'll work on your paperwork and it's not worth it. Whereas it's if not. you pay that attorney, even if it's, even if they're not charging you say the full price that they would normally right. charge, they're going to pay more attention and they're going to fight for you better. And they're, and they're, and they're shocked right. when I tell them these things. And I'm like, well, I mean, you like getting paid when you go to work, right? Yep. With your attorneys working for you. Well, and, and we have overhead and our licensing yeah. fees and all of these things yeah. that if we do pro bono, which I'm not against doing pro bono, the problem is, is that pro bono doesn't feed our families, right? It doesn't Correct. feed us. And, and at the end of the day, if we can't eat, right? Because we're doing pro bonos, as well as intentioned as that is, that's not positive for anybody, right? It's the right. old, you gotta put on your own oxygen mask before you put help yeah. someone else with theirs. And so 
charging people and being able to at least have the money to, to, to live, right? I mean, that's really what we're talking about here. Um, and pay our rent and pay our, you know, fees and all those other things that we have to go through allows us to help you. But if you choose, like I had a matter where this young lady wants me to take it on pro bono and, and I don't do pro bono matters. And, and, and I explained it to her like this, if I do your matter pro bono, then I don't have the time to spend doing other matters that are paying me that allow me to stay in business. Correct. I don't have the resources in order to do that and do it well. And so I proposed an alternative payment plan that I, we're going to talk about it. But the idea being that there's, there's also the, the idea that people need to have a little bit of skin in the game, right? Like they need to exactly. feel like they're invested in something. Yeah. Um, probably one of the best ones I've heard yet, though. And this one you can use. I had a fellow attorney, a family law attorney, so very relevant, said to me, she said, if your own family won't loan you the money to get out of a bad situation. Right. Why am I going to? Exactly. And, and that's not a judgment on the fact that, like, I, the, but the, that's a reality, right? Like, I mean, that's a funny way of looking at it, but the idea is, is that you can't, like, I'm not a bank, right? Like, I'm not, that shouldn't be my goal is to worry about you paying. And I think right. that that's a, a very different perspective than a lot of attorneys. Uh, have because if if I set you up and I charge you only so little, then that strains our relationship, right? Exactly. Like it 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 creates a negative relationship because yes. I'm not able to survive myself, right? And then all I'm trying to do is get you out the door. You want you should want me to spend time on your matter. Exactly. That that's so. just how it is. Yeah. So what type of so you so nonprofit what? I, I know what that means from a tax perspective, but how, so how besides clients paying nominal fees, how do you stay in business? Because I can't imagine those nominal fees are adding up to being able to help as many people as you want to. So how do you help as many people as you do? So we also get um, grants. Now okay. we choose not, yeah. So we choose not to get uh, government grants oh. because yeah, government grants, believe it or not, tie your hands. Because the government is telling you who you can serve, how you can serve them, and um, with what services. So a government grant would tell me, you can only help women who are between the ages of 25 and 30, who have three children, and have been abused within the last two years. Okay? So, you know, and, and, are, and only speak Spanish. All right. Well... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, the problem is, or they'll even put this in, and are only from the coastal area of Oceanside. Yes. That's a bit too specific. Exactly. And that's how government grants are. They're very specific. And you, they tell you, or you tell them, okay, we're going to serve 100 women within this, I don't know, year, the year, maybe the grants for a year. And... The problem is, is how do you find those women? What right. if you don't find the hundred women? Well, they take the grant from you or right. you don't follow the grant to a T. So when I was with the other nonprofit, um, there were women who came to me because I could only help women who were from Vista and Ramona, because mm. according to the statistics at that time, that's where the highest concentration of abused women came from. No. That's just where most of the women called from, oh, so, right? Yeah. So there were women who would call me who were from Oceanside or San Marcos. So what I would do to be able to help them was I would make up addresses in Ramona and Vista so that I could help them. Interesting. Hmm. Yes. Because yeah. otherwise, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's interesting that, you know, the government... Oh goodness, we could we could go off on them for a while. Um, the 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 problem is is that it, they're not helping the people that need to be helped, like the the, the overall population, right? Um, you know, and 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 I kind I get that when we're you know we're talking about resources and funds and that limited resources and limited funds, um, that that they have to be a little more careful, right? But I think. 
like I've known people that are on WIC, which for those of you who've never heard of WIC, um, it's Women's Infant and Children. And it's, it's basically a program for, for a low-income people that provide basic necessities, which milk, Correct. cheese, eggs, cereal, things of that nature. And the program is such that it used to be that they would give you checks and you would have to go to Walmart or wherever. And the, these checks would be for a specific thing or a specific yeah. several things. And you had to either get all of those things or it, it was all or, or, or you, you all lost or on, yeah, it was all or nothing. And <laughs> they were very specific about what type of bread you could get, yeah. what type of cereal you could get, the ounceage yeah. of the cereal the yeah. uh the type of juice that you could get to the point yeah. where you're like okay but it's the same type of juice it's just not a it, it has it has 100 percent vitamin c instead of 120 percent vitamin c right. as though you can actually deal with um as if you could actually deal with more than 100 percent of vitamin c right. but the, the the issue though is that it, it was so specific that you're like okay this helps but it it infantile in and Infantiles, infantiles, and my mouth. Um, it, it treats you like a child. It's very patronizing, right? Exactly. It's like, like I don't know what's better for my health, this thing or that thing. Like in in the in the like, okay, if you're looking at the macronutrients of a cereal, if two identical cereals or two cereals that have the same macro footprint, why can't I pick the one that I like better, right? Like. Or, and, and so this idea that, that while the government means well, and I, I think that it, it does help, and it's certainly appreciated for people, that when they get that specific, then are you helping or hurting the people more, right? Like you're, you're and, and I'm not saying to not be grateful. Absolutely. The people that I've known that have been on WIC were absolutely grateful for what they were able to get because it, it helped uh, get you from point A to point B in some months, that's what you needed, right? Like if you just needed that, that's okay. So there's no, no judging there, but I wish that they, that if they are considering these types of programs, that they wouldn't just consider the money that's in the factor, but how it affects the person that's, that's using the resources. In fact, the people that I know that were on it, they would have to wait in line for an absurd amount of time because of the way the checks were written, because the people that were supposed to be ringing you up would take forever. Yeah. And, and so you, you feel embarrassed because while the cashier was frustrated at you, the people in line behind you were even more frustrated at you. Yeah. And you're just praying that nobody gets madder than they already are, right? Because nobody right. wants to sit in line longer than they have to. Yeah. So I, I bring that up as, as a way of nonprofits solve a problem. Your, yours certainly solves the issue, which... You know, it's it's sad that we even have that issue, right? Like, it's just it's it's, you know, it it takes away the humanity of it, right? Like, we're we're and and don't even get me started on some of the mo most recent anti-women uh, legislation that's happening throughout our country. Um, those are are horrific, uh, in, in my opinion. Um, that there it seems to be a war on women, um, and it's quite sad because. The irony is, is I've never heard of a woman starting a war. Right. And, and in fact, my wife and I were discussing this the other day, like, because my daughter actually asked, why are, why are men more bad than women? Her words. And, uh, and I said, sweetheart, and because and I have lots of analysis I could do on that one. <laughs> um, but I'm like, sweetheart, um, I don't know. And, and, and mainly because she's, she's seven, so I don't want to tr try to explain the nuance of gender differences and why men seem to feel the need to conquer the world and wh whatever. But I've never heard of a woman starting a war, right? Like not, not <laughs> anyway. Um, so, so what is it like the day-to-day -day operations of a business of, of a nonprofit? So day-to-day, -day, um, so my secretary will come in, uh, she'll, she'll open the door. We turn on the lights, we turn on the music, because you gotta have music in here. Um, you know, some we usually make appointments for the clients because it just makes it easier to make an appointment. We have some walk-ins. Um, we, we they'll come in and want information about uh, divorce or custody or you know, restraining orders, whatever it may be. We explain our process to them, we help them understand what they need to do, what uh, how we're gonna help them you know, uh, and everything that 
that they uh, are going to need for the uh, for the process. Uh, we'll hook them up with Leticia, and Leticia will you know she'll fill out the uh, documents for them. She'll take them to the court, get them filed. Uh, we'll call them back so they can pick up their documents. And then once they pick up their documents, we we'll explain to them, you know, all their court dates that they have. Uh, if they want, they can come back to our office for their court date and do their virtual court here. And, uh, you know, because we offer that too, because we know sometimes people don't have computers. They, they right. don't even have to turn one on. Uh, so, you know, we sometimes we have walk-ins, you know, they just come, they walk in, they want to know what, you know, how we can help them. Um, sometimes, you know, that's why I'm glad I have Leticia because she's the one that does the paperwork. And right. then if people need supervised visits, then I have my six monitors who do the supervised visits, uh, throughout North County and one who is in, uh, San Diego County. So it really just, you know, day to day, it's, we never know. People always ask us, what time do you close? We don't know because it depends on the day. Sometimes we close early, like maybe 4, 4.30. Mm -hmm. And other days, me and Letty have been here up until nine at night. Oh my. With whatever they need. So that, it just depends on the day. <laughs> that's impressive. I couldn't, I mean, you know, I'll work for my clients till, you know, evening, but it sometimes, or, or quite often, it's like, there's nothing that urgent that requires me to stay. Um, I, I mean, I will work through things, but, uh, you know, and sometimes I'll work late if I need to, but generally speaking, it's like, there's no, in, in, there's really no true emergency, right? Th these aren't life and death situations that I deal with most of the time. Um, so, uh, <laughs> tell me about like, cause one of the things that, that, that I try to talk about on tactical startup here is about people's intention with their work. Um, there's, there's a lot of people that just kind of start doing whatever they're going to do and then just kind of whatever. And it's just kind of lazy, whatever the heck happens, happens. Um, you've been in business long enough now that, I, I mean, you've, you've made it over the five year hump, which congratulations by a lot, right? Like, so that's awesome. Um, you know, like I'm sure it's been a struggle, right? Like there've been moments where you're like, I don't know how I'm going to make it to the next month. I don't know how I'm going to make it till next week. And I'm almost positive. I could say you probably don't know how you'd make it till the next day some days. Yeah. Um, and any entrepreneur that's been a, a business owner an entrepreneur for any period of time has been at least at some point in those situations. Oh, yes. So, so I have two questions for you. What has your planning looked like and how do you hold on despite all of the crazy, right? Like all of the things that happen to you that you can't control how do you hold on? What gives you the motivation drive to keep going when that happens? Well, there's actually two things that keep me going. A is God, because I cry to him a lot and I pray a lot and uh, just say, okay, you know what, Lord, thank you for the, thank you for clients today. Thank you, you know, for whoever walks in. Right. Uh, so that keeps me going. And, and the clients that I've helped, I, I mean, they come, I can be walking around Walmart, you know, or somewhere in Oceanside and I'll hear, ah, Dona Ana, you know, and I'll go, uh, and I turn around and like, oh, thank you so much. You know, right. you helped me with whatever it was. And, and, uh, and uh, of course, I don't remember her because right, I've helped so many people now. Right. Uh, and my staff has helped so many people. And uh, I would go, oh, I'm so happy that things worked out for you, you know, and that, yeah. you know, how's everything going? And then they'll tell me and then they'll give me those hugs and, you know, and I've gotten thank you cards, you know, I actually I hang them up on my wall now. So I get, I get those thank you cards and I mean, it's the clients to keep me going. It's, it's God that helps me stay sane, you know, right. and I think one of the things that's really helped me is that it's advice that Roger gave me years ago. Uh, I remember one day he told me, he said, he said, Annie, I'm going to tell you something. When that client comes in to see you, remember, they've had that problem already for a long time. You are not going to solve their problem within a day or two. It's going to take a while to get them out of that situation. Right. And I was like, wow, that's so true. Because I used to worry about my clients. I used to go, oh my gosh, is she going to show up for her restraining order? You know, is she going to show up for her hearing? Is she going to do this? Is she going to do that? And that's when Roger had to tell me, you know what? 
she may or she may not. Right. And, and it's okay. You've already, you did what you needed to do. She needs to do her part. Right. And if she doesn't, that, that's on her, you know, and if she really wants help, she'll come back to you. So that's something that really, really helped me. And, you know, the other thing that really helps me is I, I always imagine that when I talk to somebody that I have a shield in front of me and that as they're telling me their story, their, their story is coming to that shield and bouncing off and going up to God because only God can actually help them through that situation and resolve it. I'm just here to give them the guidance, to hold their hand, to fill out the paperwork, but really it's God who's going to help them through that situation and, and help them with what they need. Yeah. I like that. Um, cause I mean, like I said, I mean, I solve legal problems, which is a, a big problem for a lot of people, right? Like, I mean, that's, they're not like they don't come to me when it's a simple, easy problem. That's just not right. what I, my role is as a, as an attorney, right? You don't hire an attorney to swat a fly, right? You, you need you've got gophers in your backyard. <laughs> you've got issues that you need significant help Correct. with, and arguably yours is uh, you know people are dealing with some severe, significant issues, um, and and I can imagine that unfortunately some of them may try to. Um, inflect that onto you, right? Like they, they feel like you're, I, I, that there's a savior esque type thing, right? Like you're not, you're not the savior, but you are their savior yeah. in that respect. Yeah. And I can imagine that that creates some interesting dynamics sometimes. Um, and, and so I know that, that sometimes that I have to say no, right? Like I get clients or potential clients that aren't a good fit right? Just simple. It's, it's nothing against them as a human being, but for them and I, we won't work well together. And I can tell that very quickly, actually. Um, and so how do you, how do you figure that out because of the, the needs of individuals, like for you as a person, I don't mean you as a business, right? Cause that's, those are two very different things. Um, as a business, you want to help everybody as human as possible. Right. But as a human being, sometimes you have to say no to things right? Like just, Correct. you just can't. So yeah. how do you deal with that? How do you deal with wanting to help everybody on the one hand and self-preservation, putting on your own oxygen mask on the other hand? So over the years, uh, God's taught me a lot of discernment. And, and one of the things that, that I learned was to really listen to what somebody is saying and what they're talking about. So I've learned to really hear and, and if I, if I hear them talk about how they want to save the relationship, how they want to save the, the abusive partner that, you know, they just want to know, they want me to go talk to the abusive partner. They want me to go somehow fix him or send him to therapy or send her to therapy. Uh, then I'll, I'll, I'm very honest. And I say, yeah, you're not ready to leave yet. I, I can tell you're not, you're not ready. I've yeah. already let you know what needs to be done. I already let you know how we can help you. I've already, you know, let you know the process. No, no, but I just want someone to just go talk to him or her. Right. I just, you know, I just want them to, you know, to change. Well, okay. But if, if they're not going to change, you're not going to change them. No. So that's kind of how, how I know is is if they all they want is somebody to go in there and go talk to that person and somehow by that by me talking to them that are miraculously going to change then i know they're not ready right, and i right. tell them no you're not ready when you're ready and they make the decision to change call me but, but you're not ready yet <laughs> it, it's funny you say that because i have um my daughter my oldest daughter the one we were talking about uh why are why why are the the majority of the bad people men <laughs> question. Right. Um, she is uh, sweet and kind, but she also is very emotional. And, and that isn't to say that that's not okay. But what happens is, is she doesn't yes, yes. deal with, with my old, my other kids very well sometimes. Um, ah. And she's, she's, she's seven. So I, my expectations are seven. Right. And so one of the things that I try to teach her is that number one, um, the only person in this entire universe, world, that you can change is yourself. Exactly. You cannot change another human being, no matter how much you want them to change. And so if you want to have a better 
you know, if you want to be less unhappy, because she'll break down in tears over sometimes everything and nothing, um, that you need to worry about yourself, right? You need to take care of yourself. You need to be happy and make choices that are positive for yourself, not for somebody else. Because at the end of the day, and I, I can't remember who, who the author was that said this, so please, I'm, I'm not trying to misquote anybody, but um, when people show you who they are, believe them, right? Exactly. Like if, if they've hurt you consistently over time mm -hmm. and they've shown you who they are, and that isn't to say that, that people can't change, but you, they have to show you that they've exactly. changed, right? And, and I think that, that when it comes to those challenges that we face as business owners, that we have to recognize that the challenges, a large portion of them are our own making, right? Yes. People, we are only accountable for ourselves. We are only able to change ourselves. And so either we surround ourselves with people that all agree with us, which is a bad idea. That's what's happening in Ukraine right now, right? I mean, like yes. realistically, uh, group think is a real problem, um, or we adapt ourselves to situations to make the best of them, whatever yes. those may be. And some days that means getting help from people like you. And some yes. days that means getting help from people like me. Exactly. And sometimes that means <laughs> making your own choices without our help, right? Yeah. Like, like, and that's just the reality. Um, that's just the, the truth. Reality. Yeah. Um, so, so I want to talk more about, um, like I, while this is a, a business, uh, you know, podcast, I want to talk more about like, what wisdom would you share with someone who's starting a business or uh, whether it be for profit or nonprofit, as we've found they're, they're largely similar to each other. They're just different, uh, different colored cows, if you will. Right. One's black, Correct. one's white. They still have meat, right. Or, or milk or whatever you choose to do with the cow. Um, or let it be if you're ve vegan or vegetarian. <laughs> so what, what would you say, what would be the wisdom that you would say to someone that's starting out how to get them from age zero to 21 years in and happy? So what comes to me is count the cost. Okay. In other words, what's it going to cost you in time and energy and funds? What's it going to cost? When, when I started the nonprofit, I had no idea what I was doing. I just knew that this is what God wanted me to do. And I jumped in both feet. So over the years, I've learned some hard lessons. Uh, surround yourself with wise counselors, people who, who aren't just going to be yes men. Yeah. People who are going to tell you, yeah, that's a good idea, but, um, you know, that's why I had my board of directors, right. um, you know, but at that time I, I was, I wasn't listening to them. Right. So you have to listen, you have to, um, you know, uh, take their counsel. And, and that was hard for me at first because, you know, I, I was a bit of a control freak. So I had to learn how not to be a control freak and, and to go, you know what? They make sense. Yeah. Okay. I guess I shouldn't do that. Um, you know, I had a business coach for a while and he was so good. He really, really helped me the business coach. You know, that's why I say wise counselors, yeah. you know, bring people around you, even before you even start, let's say you're good at knitting and you want to start selling, you know, stuff that you knit, right. you know, yeah, what's it going to cost for you to do that in, in materials? What are you going to charge for it? You know, because I, I don't charge very much. Like for a restraining order, I charge like 150 to do a right. restraining order. And I still have people go, oh, that's just so expensive. But it's like, but you have to consider the cost. What does it right. cost me in time? What does it cost me in, you know, having to go take them to get it, uh, filed. And I mean, you have to count those, take all those things into consideration. What kind of certificates are you going to need? What do you, what are the fees for getting incorporated? What are the fees for whatever you need for your business? Cause there's right. fees. Nothing's free. No fees. Nothing's you know? free. What's yeah. it going to cost for you to market? Do you need to hire someone to market? Or are you going to do the marketing? You know, how are you going to market on Facebook? Do you need to hire someone to help you? Or are you going to do it all yourself? I mean, it isn't just Okay, I'm going to start a business. There are so many steps to starting a business. Right. 
need to count the cost before you even start. Because I think, in my opinion, that's the problem is people just, okay, let's just start this thing. Okay. But what's it going to cost you to start this thing? Time, energy, people. So while you're absolutely 100% correct, and I think that, that your, your advice has substantial value, I think we need to talk about the converse of that. Um, people that spend so much time in analyzing the, and fear-based, they never actually get started. Right. So the, the, you're, you're in the, like, and, and, and I'm, I'm talking about a balanced approach, right? You're talking about the people that jump in without any plan. And I'm talking about the plan, the people that plan so much that they never actually do it. Right. And so what I try to teach, and this is what I talk about a lot is more of an iterative approach, right? You start with what you know, and then you keep learning and keep going and you learn more along the way and you do better each time. So you're not subject to the analysis paralysis problem, right? And you're not not planning at all, right? Like those are the two seem to be like most entrepreneurs I work with, they're either in one or those two camps. They either don't want to get started because they're afraid of, of failing. That's, that's the big one. Or they started and they have no plan, therefore no direction. And then they're miserable because they have no plan and no direction. Right. And so I see both ends of that spectrum and I say, okay, so what's, what's, the, what's a more manageable thing, right? Your fear is kicking your trash over here and your, uh, you, your, your two no planning is kicking your, your potential for success. Right. And so... Uh, like what I talk about is iterative, right? Like start with a basic plan. Okay, here's what I want to do. And then work backwards, right? And then think, okay, here's what I need to do in order to accomplish that goal. And then go from there. Um, right. But I think that's, that's so important. You know, people that just jump in uh, with both feet, which is, is yes. both admirable and scary all at the same time, is okay. But, but a better one is maybe testing the waters a little bit with the toe and then jumping in. And then something. jumping in, right, exactly. exactly. So unfortunately, I did the jump, jump in with both feet. But, you know, God's grace carried me through. And, and sure. you know, he brought good people around me to help me, to teach me, to kind of guide me. And as I learned all those things, I was like, oh, that's right. what I got to do. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and I think that that's another valid point. Thank you uh, for pointing that out, is that, you know, having people that can give you advice um, and can help mentor you. Um, I know that, that I have attorneys that reach out to me and talk to me about what has worked for me in building my practice or, uh, you know, and, and I have an MBA and, and I'm not, so there's, I look at things from multifaceted. I'm not just a, an attorney that my sole focus is solving your legal problem because sometimes it's a business problem, right? That right. while there might be a legal answer, a business solution might be a better one than the legal answer. Um, but, you know, and, that, and that's, that's what a lot of entrepreneurs try to like scrimp on. Um, you know, Stephen R. Covey once talked about, you know, what would he do? He would sharpen the ax, right? He talks right. about like preparing yourself to do the best job that you can do before you're worried about cutting down that tree, right? You try to cut the tree down with the sledgehammer, it's gonna be a long, hard, painful lesson, right? Versus if you're cutting that tree down with a long, like a nice, sharp, like laser sharpened ax, whatever it is that you need to do to make sure that ax is legit, how much faster will you be? How much easier will your goals be if you're okay? And it really comes back to that whole putting on your own oxygen mask, right? A lot of there's, there's this weird culture in entrepreneur world that says I have to work, you know, 80 to 90 hours a week or I'm not going to be successful. <laughs> and it's just not manageable. People yeah. burn out. People get stressed. They do stupid things. They make bad choices. Um, you know, they've done studies that show that you're as intoxicated on one or two drinks as you are with lack of sleep. Right. And it's like, can you make good decisions when you're intoxicated? There's a reason why we don't have you operate heavy machinery while you're intoxicated. Right. Exactly. So, so these, these gurus that all talk about, oh, you shouldn't even sleep. Well, no, uh, you should no. sleep. You need yeah. to sleep. You need to, your body needs that time to, some of my best ideas have come when I've been asleep. And I'm not saying you sleep all the time, right? I'm not <laughs> suggesting you, you, no, no, no. But 
but allowing your body to naturally a- achieve its goals. You no, know, some days, some days you got to get stuff done, right? You just have to work on the thing that needs to get done. But there are other days where you're like, no, I need to take care of me in order to be better for myself and for my company and for my clients and whatnot. Um, so what are ways that you help like yourself? Like what, what, what type of self care do you do in order to make sure you're at your best, um, consistently? So, uh, in the mornings I have my coffee, I read my Bible, I journal. And in the evenings, after a long day of listening to everybody's story, I chill and I play Scrabble. Scrabble. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> it's it just a really cool way. And, and I, li- I, I like to say I listen to um, Trash TV. Okay. So I'll have like uh, the Golden Girls on. Or... Oh, that's not Trash TV. That's not. I love no. the Golden Girls. Golden right? Girls are awesome. Golden yeah, Girls are awesome. Them. But I'll, wear, I'll do something like that, you know, just mm-hmm. something I'm not really listening, but I'm playing my Scrabble game or sometimes, you know, just just things that just help me unwind, sure. you know, um, you know, sometimes just feeding my my cats and my dog and, you know, just relaxing because, you know, as much as I love my clients and listening to their stories and helping them and doing what needs to be done. You know, I just enjoy just relaxing, just going home and just not even thinking about the clients, you know, not even I I tell my staff, you know, because sometimes the clients will call and they want an update about something and I'll go, "Uh, who helped you? Uh, It was the other girl. I'll go, Leticia. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what it was. And I'll go, "Okay, I'll have her call you because I don't always remember who it is. And I'll go, hey, Letty, your client Maria called. (laughs) Here's her number. Call her back. Because I don't always remember. I mean, I'm just like, once I hand off the client, I hand it off the client. Right. You know, something I learned in the Army where if you'll have a week when I would go to school with the Army. And you learn, you learn, you learn. But you need to learn for the test the next day. You take the test. You you regurgitate it out. And then and then I forget about it until, okay, now i got to learn for the next thing. And, and I guess I've gotten used to that now. So that I help the client. So unless I see that client more than one or two times, you know, I'm like, uh, I don't remember who that is. Uh, let me, I think Letty helped them. Let me pass them on to Letty. And she'll know right. exactly, you know, what they're talking about. Because I'll be like, Letty, she's talking about this. And she's like, oh, yeah, I know what that is. And now cow power. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So <laughs> I, I think, and, and another thing that, that you wisely point out is that, you know, you have people you can delegate things to. Yes. So many entrepreneurs try to be everything to everyone. <laughs> they're their own marketing. They're their own accounting. They're their own attorney, right? Exactly. <laughs> and it's not their highest, best use of time, no. right? Uh-huh. Like if, if one of the analogies that are not analogies, one of the stories that a lot of owners have talked about is if you – can charge a thousand dollars an hour for your time now and obviously nobody gets a thousand dollars except for like crazy 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 ceos but if you could charge a thousand dollars for your time the the p things that you should delegate is anything that can be done for cheaper than your thousand dollars an hour right what is the highest best use of your time and that means that sometimes they're not going to do it as perfect as you right they're going to do it their version of perfect because they're not inside your head. That's the thing is that they don't understand is that it's not, it's not that they're bad. It's that they're not, they don't understand you perfectly. Therefore they can't do the job perfectly. But if they're able to do it 80% as well as you, then they should be doing it, not you. Right? Exactly. Because your best use of time is not doing that task, whatever it is. Like if it's marketing, you shouldn't be doing it because Someone exactly. else is going to do it a lot better than you, right? Like if it's accounting, heck, legal, this is a big one. People are like, oh, I don't have the money. Like you don't have, you don't not have the money, right? Like right. like the, the difference of lawsuit, right? If I solve a problem for, and, and I'm just using this for several thousand dollars, right? I'm not saying that's what we're talking here. But if I solve a problem for $2,000 and litigation for something is, 10 to 30,000, maybe even $40,000, which would you rather pay 2000 or 30,000? And I'm just using that as a, for instance, 
And so the idea that, that it's like, well, I'd rather pay the two. The problem is, is you don't know when you're going to have to pay that 30. So right. would you rather take a, a small risk with two or a huge risk that you won't pay 30 or 50 exactly. or more than that? And I think that that's that the risk reward factor goes towards anything. Same thing goes for accounting. Same thing goes for bookkeeping. Anything that it that another professional, another human being can do better than you or or 80 percent as good as you. Should they should do it right? Like and, and so getting out of this, I'm a one man band perspective uh, is, is difficult, though, because you, you see this money that you can't get back, right? You have to spend it on people doing this work, which is fine. But one of my mentors, who is actually going to be on the podcast at a later time, he is, he talks about, would you rather have $500,000 profit on a million dollar firm? Or would you rather have $500,000 profit on a $10 million firm? And the answer is, I'd rather have a $500,000 profit on a $10 million firm. Right? Because how many people are you helping with that $10 million that you're not helping on that million dollar firm? And exactly. what quality of life are you giving to those people that you wouldn't get otherwise? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So focusing on quality, not just, ooh, I want all this money, right? Like I need right. all this money to survive and that's fine when you're in the beginning. But if you ever want to grow, right, you need your marketing team. You need your accounting. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I learned, uh, and this I learned in the, in the army from a very, very, very smart sergeant. He said, look, you got to learn to delegate because you can't do everything. So if you know the private snuffy is the best potato peeler in the whole platoon, you send him to go peel those potatoes. And if you know that, you know, little private Johnny is the best at, you know, cutting up those carrots, you send him to do that. And I was like, Man, that's a really good idea. I was really young at that time. But so I've taken that with me throughout. Now, it was hard when I first started because it was only me. But I had to let go. There came a moment where I had to let other people help me or I wouldn't have survived. Right. So, you know, now I have, you know, I, I have Letty who does, you know, the, the family law stuff. I have my secretary. I have someone now who's doing fundraising. I have the supervision monitors who go out and do the super supervising, you know, so I'm getting my, I have a good team now where I can focus on all the other stuff that I have to do now as a, uh, as a CEO top dog, you know, whatever right. you want to call me because, you know, I have to go out and shake those hands and, you know, right. meet people and, you know, go to the networking and, you know, and even that pretty soon I'll be leaving to Toya who does the fundraising and, you know, Nice. It's just you have to have your team to you take care of you, you know? And and to take care of each other. I think that's the important yeah, thing is that, like, you can accomplish. I, I hate this acronym, okay? So I'm just going to say that to the beginning. But, you know, the whole team, together, everyone achieves more. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I hate I hate that acronym. I truly, truly do. Like, it it, it makes me have the willies, actually. Um, because while it's it's true, I'm not suggesting it's false. The the idea though is that that you know it it a group of people can accomplish more than an individual can, right? And that's that's really what you're talking about. So getting out of this mindset of you have to do everything um, will get you there a lot faster, right? Like it's it's the difference of of, yeah. of rowing a ship, right? A rowboat yes. with a single person versus a rowboat with two people. You're going to yes. go a lot farther, a lot faster with more than one person, period. Exactly. There's exactly. no way around it. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, so before we, we're, we're getting ready to wrap up. Uh, but before we go, any wisdom that you would like to share with my listeners that is just like your mantra, like the thing that you've learned that you just love <laughs> to talk to people about? Ah, you know what? It, it's okay to fall down as long as you get back up. It's okay to make a mistake as long as you correct it. You know, because I think people are afraid, like they start things and they think they have to do everything so perfectly, you know. Oh my gosh, you know, what if I make a mistake? 
well, so what? So you made a mistake. You yeah. correct it and you keep on moving because you can't let yourself get stopped by that fear of making a mistake. Right. You know, I, I have a good friend who um, she's she she overthinks things. And even when I was doing my dissertation, I would sometimes overthink things and I would have to stop myself and go just right. Just right. What's the worst that can happen? Just right. right. So I, I had to get out of that. And, and I have to teach I have to teach my friend that, you know, I've, I talked to her about it. It's like, it's OK. It's OK to make a mistake. It's OK to fall down. It's, it's OK. Just get back up. Yeah. And correct it. Don't don't stay laying on the floor crying and being depressed because that's right. not going to help you. We're human. I've, I've made through the years, I have made so many mistakes. The only reason why the nonprofit is still here after all these years is because God has not allowed me to give up. He, he just hasn't. It, it's yeah. just like, okay, now get up. You've cried. You've been depressed. You felt sorry for yourself. Now knock that shit out. Now let's go. I'm nice. Like, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Like, okay, that's awesome. let's go. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, that, I think that's a valid point. Uh, yeah, I love it. I love it. That's, that's awesome. Um, all right. So last, so one of the things I like to do with my guests is share fun answers to questions so that okay. they can get to know you better. Um, because at the end of the day, that's what this is about. Uh, sharing your stories, but sharing uh, your wisdom, but also who you are, because it, you're, you're the face and, and the important person, right? I mean, like in your life, you're the most important person in your life, right? Um, so this first one is, what is the funniest or most disappointing, weirdest, whatever, text that you've ever received? <laughs> so, of course, you know, I work with a lot of Latinas. Mm -hmm. All of them have Mar uh, Maria somewhere in their name. So I used to, <laughs> and I still do, I get texts that will say, Anna, it's Maria, call me. And I'm like, Okay, which Maria? <laughs> the one from San Marcos, Escondido, Oceanside, Vista. Uh, kind of need a little bit more information there. <laughs> nice. So while mine isn't a, a weird text or whatever, it was a phone call. My mother had passed away. Oh. And she had thought she was going to die several times. And so <laughs> she's a bit of a hypochondriac. Oh. And so she'd, she'd passed away, supposedly. We'd seen her. It, we FaceTimed, and she's in Idaho, and I was in San Diego. So we didn't get to be there when she passed away. But approximately an hour after she had supposedly died, I got a phone call from her number. <laughs> oh, no. What had happened was they had, she had given or she would sold her cell phone or her number had gotten reassigned to somebody else. It wasn't my mother. It was a bunch of teenage girls <laughs> that had accidentally oh, no. called me. But on my phone, it said my mother's name. And oh, so no. here I am after an hour after my mother passes away. I'm thinking my mother is calling me. Either she didn't die or she's calling me from the grave. Either way, it was a <laughs> freaky experience that that happened. That's funny. Um, but, yeah, that was the weirdest, most, I mean, coincidental. I don't know how... I don't have, I didn't have words. I still don't have words as to how that happened, but that was just one of those moments in life where you're like, I don't, I don't know how to explain that one. <laughs> um, next question is, would you rather be the best player on a horrible team or the worst player on a great team? No, I think I'd rather be the worst player on a good team because at least then I can learn. At least I can go, Hey, <laughs> yeah. help me do better. Teach uh, me. <laughs> I like that. I like that. And studies have shown that typically people that are bad will improve to the average, the mean of the good of the good group. So being in, the, I think that's a great. That's what my answer would have been too. Or that's what my answer is. Um, I'd much rather be, because and I'm a, I'm terrible at sports. Sports are not my thing. That is not my gift. I wish it had have been because I love sports to watch. But man, me and sports do not go well together. So last, certainly not least, is what things do you do every day that you wish could be automated? Oh, my gosh. There's so many, but I can only pick one. <laughs> Probably driving in traffic. Man, there are days I'm like, oh, my gosh. Can't you go faster? I mean, it's like, yeah. 
can't I just like put it like the Jetsons? Okay, I'm at work. <laughs> I know, right? That would be nice. Right. I don't really, I've automated as much as I can automate at this point. I mean, there's still some things, but like just the, the, the difficult, the, the annoying stuff, the stuff that just takes my time that shouldn't. Right. <clears throat> Well, thank you so much, uh, Anna, for coming on and, and being here. I sincerely appreciate the wisdom that you've shared and definitely unique opportunity. Um, where can my listeners find you if they'd like to reach out for either your services or maybe to donate if possible? Um, okay. Uh, they can uh, just look up my uh, website. Okay. And the website is www.lasvalientes. Uh, I'll spell that. It's lasvalientes.org. And it's uh, L as in Lima, A as in Alpha, S as in Sierra, V as in Victor, A as in Alpha, O as in Lima, I as in India, E as in Echo, N as in November, T as in Tango, E as, e as in Echo, and S as in Sierra.org. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me and uh, look forward to my listeners having an opportunity to learn more about you and your story and hopefully they can come and help and uh, do what you can, what they can do to help you. So it was great Wonderful. talking with you. Yes, thank you. Welcome. That was Anna and she was absolutely great. I've known her for a few years now through Facebook and uh, I wanted her to come on and share with you because there are so many opportunities to serve. You don't have to restrict your mind to one idea of entrepreneurship or one idea of how you want to contribute. As you can see, she jumped in with both of her feet and said, I'm going to help women and this is where I want to be. So there's so many opportunities. So don't restrict yourself to, oh, this is the current trend or this is the current opportunity that we have. Thank you so much for joining me this week. Uh, as always, whenever you're thinking about your business, think how you can grow and how you can do things, but think tactically. And we'll talk to you later. Have a good one.